What's up, everyone? We're back. Dr. Maxfield, I'm Dr. Shah, and welcome back to our channel, Dr. Lee, where we talk about all things skincare and dermatology. We are back together here in Charlotte, North Carolina, shooting videos related to skincare, and we are so excited to be back together again. It's been way too long. <laughs> it has. It's crazy. Life is just, it's life, but so glad to be back. So today, this is actually by popular demand. Mm -hmm. um, this was the top comment on another video where people want to hear about scars. So today we're going to talk about how to treat scars and how to prevent scars. And specifically, we're not going to be focusing on acne scars because we've done a video on acne scars in the past. We're going to be focusing more on like injury scars and surgical scars, C-section scars and scars like that. So all things scars here we go here we go So scars are particularly important to us, not only because as dermatologists, we try to help people with their scars, but because as most surgeons, we actually try to minimize scars after removing some pretty aggressive, extensive skin cancer. So this is like, this is a big part of our battle in real life is minimizing scars. Right, so we not only do we treat scars, but we also prevent scars that we create. <laughs> or like, we, like, you know, we're doing the surgeries. We don't want you to have a scar afterwards. If you do have a scar afterwards, the benefit is that we could treat that scar. So. <laughs> You know, we do our best to minimize that. That being said, if you're going into a surgery, this is super important to know. Anytime needle breaks skin, there is risk of scar. And so if anyone tells you, if, if like if I told you, me, I don't care if it's me or I don't care who it is, if they came up to you and they told you, I'm gonna do surgery on your skin and you're not gonna have a scar, then I would run very far away from that person because there's so many things to determine how your scar is gonna heal. It's not just how I do the surgery, it's not just how you take care of the wound, but it's also how your body decides it wants to heal. The risk of injury and scar is always there anytime you cut into the skin. Exactly. And like things you may learn about yourself as you go is like maybe you have a risk of keloids. Maybe it's on an area that's a high risk, like the chest and back. So there's so much that goes into it. Um, but we're going to talk about all of the different types of scars and what you can do for it. So what is a scar? What are the types of scars? Okay. So a scar is basically when your skin is injured, a wound healing process occurs. And then you have a cell called the fibroblast. Fibroblast lays down collagen in a scar like pattern, right? So it's not like your regular collagen that's underneath your epidermis dermis inside of your dermis, you can feel it. It's hard. That's what a scar is. It feels hard. And there are multiple ways that it can heal. You can have atrophic scars where the scars are flat. You can have hypertrophic scars where the scars come out of the skin, but they stay within the wound. And you can have keloids that are scars that expand beyond the wound. Exactly. And then under the microscope, we see the same kind of changes. So initially we get this in, uh, increase in type three collagen, then that remodels to be an increase in type one collagen. And with each types of these scars, whether it's a normal scar, hypertrophic or keloidal scar, you can just see the difference here in the collagen. It's just a tremendous difference in how the collagen lays down organized, disorganized, thick bubblegum collagen, depending on how it heals. There's a normal progression for wound healing as well, where it starts with the inflammatory phase, then it goes to the proliferative phase, and then it goes into the remodeling phase. During all of this time, you're gonna be trying to help treat it. It's also important to know that you don't know what the final way that your scar is gonna look until about a year. A year is when a scar reaches maturity, and at that year point, you never have normal skin in that area. It's only about 80% as strong as it used to be. And so it, about a year is when you need to really decide, like, how's my scar look? Because at that point, you may want to revision. All right, so first up, how do you prevent the scar after your skin has been injured in some capacity? Yes, so the old adage, and I still hear this from time to time, is that you should just let this thing air out. Like, if it's wet, let it dry. And I can say unequivocally that that is not the way to do it. it invariably now at this point, I can tell when a person has let their wound dry out when I see them at the fall visit it's night and day so the more moist you keep this area the more occlusive you put your dressing and ointment on the better it's going to heal this is 100% true after looking thousands of surgical scars and follow-up and we we give very specific instruction on how to take care of the wound afterwards and I can tell you when people are not following the wound care instructions because the way it heals even within two weeks is substantially different depending on how you take care of that scar so 100% keep the wound moist, common misconception. Okay, so you want to keep the wound moist. Mo uh, yeah, you want to keep the wound moist. We can agree on that. What are you doing to keep the wound moist? Okay, so there's a lot of things that people will tell you to do. They'll tell you to wash uh, the skin with hydrogen peroxide, wash it with alcohol. You don't want to do any of those things, actually. All of those delay wound healing. What you want to do is just wash with soap and water. That's the only thing you want to do is washing your wounds. Next, what do you put on it? So there's Neosporin, there's Bacitracin at the stores. You don't want to use any of that stuff either. Not only are they super high risk for contact allergy, but they're not really going to benefit the wound healing process in 
any capacity, right? So no Neosporin, no Bacitracin, no triple antibiotic ointments. All you simply need to do for most wounds is put something like Vaseline on it. And let me take a moment just to dunk on vitamin E again. So Dr. Shaw put out another video within the last few months about vitamin E because it went viral. And this, this is what we talked about before. Like vitamin E is not helpful for wound healing, especially in its pure concentrated form. If you're gonna use a skin oil, which I actually don't think you should, I think you just use Vaseline, like Dr. Shaw said. If you're gonna use a skin oil, you'd want one with high in linoleic acid, like sunflower oil, safflower oil, even jojoba, argon, coconut. Those all might help. But again, I think they're inferior to just Vaseline. Right, and we've actually studied a lot of what happens during wound healing when you put Vaseline on a wound. And you basically get this like leapfrog effect of your skin cells where they start to actually heal. So like, even though you're under an occlusive dressing, you would think, oh, how's it gonna heal itself if it has something on top of it? No, it's actually helping it heal. Like 100%, we can guarantee this is the best thing that you can do for your wound. The only exception is if your dermatologist or whoever removes something from your skin tells you to put another antibiotic ointment on it, something like mupirocin, follow those instructions, of course. We don't wanna give any advice that your doctor didn't give you. But in general, for most wounds, simply pure white petrolatum. Exactly. And I think that's a really good point because, yeah, I, I also personalize my wound care instructions per patient, per surgical site, per location, per size of the flap and reconstruction. So don't think that everything we're saying is like a 100% hard fast rule applies to everyone universally. Nothing does. Um, so we're caveating this. If your doctor told you otherwise, I would listen to them because they know your skin. All right. So now you're in the wound healing process. You're maybe two, three months down the road. You're starting to form a scar. What do you want to put on that? Okay, so you go to the scar aisle of CVS and you see scar treatments and they're going to be two major players in the spot. You either have the choice of putting onion extract on your skin or you have silicone. So which one are we going with? If you have to pick one, you go with silicone. Right. Okay, so Mederma contains an onion extract in it and Mederma was almost the dog on what you were supposed to put on scars. And there was a good paper that came out on the benefits of this onion extract that's in Mederma to help with scars. And then later on, they did the meta-analysis that analyzed Mederma and found that it probably does not have benefit. And the, and the benefits that people are probably seeing are just because they're keeping the wound moist rather than the actual onion extract doing something for the skin. Now, I'm gonna caveat this because I, I love playing devil's advocate. We do know with onion extract, it's been studied in a couple different capacities. So you, you will find studies showing that onion extract can be helpful. So we know that onion extract from in vitro studies can inhibit like fibroblast activity. So it kind of can temper the remodeling and the scar growth in theory. A lot of the clinical studies with onion extract have actually been combined with other hydrating and moisturizing ingredients. And I think that's where some products might be better than others. Some of them do actually combine this onion extract with other ingredients that would mimic maybe some of those smaller clinical studies than just like a pure onion extract itself. Now, this is a moment I've been waiting for. This is where I dunk on Dr. Shaw. There was a study, there was a study, a head-to-head -head study showing that onion extract was comparable to uh, silicone and scar gel in terms of benefit. When did it come out? Let's let's check. I have everything bookmarked at all times. I bet you I could find a study that shows that turmeric is superior to both. This came out in 2017. Who published it? Moderma? <laughs> No disclosures. Private study. What journal was this published? <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> Fair enough. I'm not against Moderma. Uh, so overall, though, there are more studies um, for silicone in the benefit of So you really can't do both. You only can do one because they're going to cover the skin most of the time. I, what I do like, and so I still prefer silicone, despite this, this relevant study, which I appreciate him staying on top of the research. That being said, I actually like the silicone like bandages that they have because there's something that actually just stick on the wound and they're reusable. So you can just apply them and cover your scar as long as your scar is not too big. So I actually, like even when I was healing my own scar from my Mohs surgery that I had on my chest, that's what I used is the silicone bandages because they're just easy to apply, easy to wash, easy to reapply. So that's what I personally prefer and it wouldn't get on my shirt, the gel. So that's what I would recommend for most people. Silicone has the most data, but turns out on an extract, has some data. We'll go some, there. Some I think data. it's a, I think it's second fiddle. Would you go that we're there? Like if you had to pick for a topical for a maturing scar, I think silicone and then just purely by data, does anything else come above onion extract for you? If you're just like does it No, anything... probably not. I would also throw in like a retinoid into the mix here because retinoids can help remodel scars and they can also help with the hyperpigmentation that occurs a lot of times with scars. So I would throw that in the mix okay. potentially. But uh lower. But uh yeah. but it will actually give you you moved on 
onion extract up higher for me because it was mega low for me. <laughs> I know it was actually. So, so, so you moved it up a little bit for me. I still, I still, yeah, good there. job. All right. So the, actually the whole thrust of that, I actually wanted him to could still deny it. Why do you say the whole thrust of things? Oh, yeah, it's not a phrase. <laughs> it is a phrase. phrase. Like the, I read old books. I read really old books. So I don't know. The thrust of it. <laughs> like nobody speaks like that. No, no. I'm always willing to concede as more information comes out. I said in the very beginning of the channel, we want to be challenged and yeah, we want to be debunked. Mm -hmm. So please debunk us because we're always open to more information. Definitely. So definitely thank you for bringing in new information. <laughs> that being said, I'm still going with self. I am too. Okay. So, all right. That's, that's, that's the topicals. Now we have some of the procedural options and these can be, these are where you really get like the most bang for buck. You get, these are the most effective. Right. And this is coming in later on in the wound healing process. So in a more mature scar, you're going to see benefits with these. But what we're looking at here is we have a lot of different options. You know, one of the good options that we have that dermatologists can perform is microneedling. So basically a device that pokes tiny little holes in the skin. This is a video of us doing this on the face just for resurfacing. And then there's another option called radio frequency microneedling that basically does the same thing as microneedling, but also introduces some heat to contract the wound. So you have radio frequency microneedling, you have regular microneedling, you can do chemical peels on scars, and then you can even do laser resurfacing on scars. Exactly. And so with the lasers, there are so many different types of lasers. We can target different components of a scar. You'll see studies of vascular lasers for early stretch marks that really just gets rid of that reddish hue to it. And then you'll see things like fractionated CO2 laser where you're poking multiple, multiple, multiple holes, similar to microneedling, just a bit more aggressive to kind of um, try to remodel that scar uh, with the laser. Trying to figure out how you should treat the scar, you should really try to go to somebody that has a lot of options. Yes. And the reason why is because he said, say that you have some a little bit of redness to the scar, but the scar is also pretty thick. You may want to treat it with something that treats the redness, the vascular lasers, and then follow that with the treatment that actually treats the collagen, like something like a CO2 laser. So it's oftentimes combining therapies that you're going to get the best results. But if you go to a place that only has micro needling, they're only going to offer you microneedling. So go somewhere that has more modalities to treat these more advanced scars. I think there's actually value of seeing a dermatologist who like understands the over-the-counter space too, is because I think it's important to have an encompassing understanding of everything out there. Even if you don't do it, it's important to know what else is available for the patient and offer it up. One of the advantages of how we train and why our training is so long is that we learn about what other people do and what other people can offer. So like, if you come to me with heart issues, like I know, like I send this to my cardiology colleague because they know so much more about how to interpret EKGs than I do, even though like I know a little bit about EKGs. And so along the process, we learn about what's in our scope of practice, what's not in our scope of practice and where we should send somebody, right? So there are certain phases of your life where you're reach where you come to me for a cosmetic procedure and I'm going to say like you got to see my my plastic surgery colleague because I can't help you with what I have in my tool shed. Exactly. But we've seen it done before. So, I mean, like been a part of a thousand deliveries. It's that firsthand experience. And I guess even it sounds like scientific anecdote where we've seen whole scope of what you could experience. And so we can kind of more individualize and personalize that information for you. So going back to lasers, a CO2 laser is one of the best options that you can have for lasers. Basically pokes tiny little holes in the skin by targeting water, produces a little bit of heat, but helps to resurface and blend that scar over time. You're probably never going to get to a hundred percent, but the idea is that you're going to get incremental improvement. I had a dermatology friend described this to me, Dr. Bonasali said that I tell people that every time we treat it, it's like you add one more Instagram filter to your <laughs> scar. So they don't go away so right away. It's it's shades of improvement that you look for with these treatments. Now, keloids, keloids are their own, their own special thing. They're a little bit different. So we have to give a little bit of nuance for that. A keloid, because it extends beyond the wound margin, there's a lot of cell signaling there. It's just completely hyperactive. These may not respond to any of the things we listed before. In fact, you take really special consideration. Even if you go so far as to cut out the keloid scar and then redo the whole surgery, there's a really good chance it comes back and can come back bigger. So sometimes with keloids, you do like a more conservative approach and that you might inject it with a steroid where you use that side effect of atrophy to your advantage, or you might inject it with other, uh, other agents. There's a lot of different injections you can use to try to stop that excessive cell growth. Or if you're using it on an area that's amenable to it, you can actually use pressure too. So if it's on the earlobe, you can do your injections and you can also actually apply constant pressure to try to help minimize it. And just also keloids on the earlobes tend to respond better than other places. So one really good treatment for your keloids keloids is actually radiation. So here to talk about radiation is a new guest, Dr. Aldeba. 
Right, right. He Perfect. decided to somehow match us today yes, inadvertently. Yes. So Dr. Aldaba is a board certified Mohs surgeon. He's also my business partner at our practice. And the reason I'm bringing him on right now is because he is a good friend of mine, but also because he is an expert at treating keloids with radiation. So when we first got our radiation machine, <laughs> So first of all, thank you for introducing me. I appreciate you having me here. I had a different shade of blue and then I wanted to match you. So can't go wrong matching Dr. Shaw. So here. <laughs> so I got the radiation machine to treat skin cancer, non-melanoma skin cancer, squamous cell carcinoma, basal cell carcinoma. But an additional benefit to radiation treatment is that after you remove the keloid, you can radiate three times three days in a row to inhibit the fibroblasts. Those are the scar producing cells. You don't actually directly inhibit the fibroblasts, you inhibit the mast cells from releasing mediators that actually then stimulate the fibroblasts to cause your keloid scar. So Dr. Shaw, here's a quick quiz. Oh God. If, if I remove a keloid sure. and I don't do anything, Sure. What is the chance that that keloid is going to recur? Like 50 50. 71%. Okay. I told you all statistics are made up. They're all made 70, up. 71%. I'll find a study that says 50 50. But if I, if I remove it and I, and I do three doses of radiation, this is superficial radiation, so it's not affecting any other site. Three doses, three days in a row. What do you think the recurrence rate will be? 20%. 3%. Three wow. to 4%. So that's, so it's been excellent. I've done it on uh, a lot of patients and so far, knock on wood, no recurrences. Radiation, a great treatment option. I've actually seen good results with it at our office. So, you know, we radiate the people afterwards. They come in three times. They do great. That process, you have to come in more often, um, but it's a good way to not have to worry about it coming back, which it's mega high risk. Exactly. And the radiation machine we use is, is the Census SRT100. Right. So it's superficial. So when people hear radiation, they think, I don't want to be radiated. But the way that these census machines are, are designed is so that it really only affects the top layer of the skin where you're trying to treat those keloids. If it's just a lick of radiation. That's how I explain it. Just a little bit. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for having me, guys. And then tying this all together. So there's kind of a time frame you can follow. Within the first two weeks after an injury or operation, you're really looking to keep it moist. So using that Vaseline to lock in all those growth factors, the hydration and the moisture, that's extremely important until, let's say, the sutures come out. Then uh, when the scar is kind of entering that remodeling phase, but it's still early and maturing, that's really when, when you want to use probably that silicone scar gel plus or minus onion extract, right? That's when that's happening. Um, but after that scar is matured, settled in and robust, if it's still there and it's just not where you want it, that's when all of those other treatment modalities come in. Up to two weeks Vaseline, two weeks to let's say six months, you're doing your silicone. And then from six months onwards, you're looking at yeah. more robust treatments that you see at your dermatologist. Yeah, perfect. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Please like, comment, and subscribe. And let us know if you like us being back together or you want to do more of the long distance <laughs> videos. <laughs> all right. We'll see you in the next one. Appreciate you always. This